So we're talking about the business case for ultraviolet uh, disinfection. And of course, a critical question to start with is why is this something we should even be talking about now? Why is why is now the moment to be uh, worried about this and to be thinking about this? So the reality is uh, the best of our lives happens indoors, but indoor health hasn't been the priority that it needed to be for quite a long time. If you think about where we spend the bulk of our time, about 90% of our time actually is indoors. So whether we're talking about keeping our kids safe in schools, keeping our workers uh, safe on the front lines, whether we want to keep our economy thriving, we need to be able to gather and to uh, be healthy in indoor space. And of course, uh, the pandemic really elevated everybody's concern and awareness of indoor um, indoor health and, and indoor air uh, space. You know, we have been monitoring water quality for many, many decades, especially uh, in, uh, you know, countries like the United States, but we only consume a few liters of water every day, but we actually consume thousands of gallons of air every day. And that's something we haven't had nearly the same level of attention to, but that's starting to change. And I wanted to point out uh, three different sources of recommendations uh, new standards and new, um, you know, guidance around air quality from ASHRAE, the CDC, and the Lancet. So let's start with ASHRAE. ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and they are the professional association that comes up with recommendations that typically end up being adopted into building codes. And ASHRAE has adopted a new standard, 241, for the control of infectious aerosols. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But in brief, they've basically said, we need to ventilate our spaces a lot more than we have previously thought or previously mandated or, or, or uh, regulated. Uh, CDC, for the first time, also came out with a recommendation around keeping uh, our air healthier. And they recommend five equivalent air changes per hour in all on our, in all occupied spaces. And the Lancet is a, a very uh, prestigious medical journal. They had a commission also looking at this issue and they recommended that six or more equivalent air changes per hour is the best for reducing exposure to uh, airborne respiratory infectious diseases. And in addition to the focus on indoor air quality, there's also, of course, a society-wide focus on improving our uh, energy use and our sustainability, reducing emissions. So one example of that, one very potent example, but of course it's just an example out of many, many initiatives all around the world, is Local Law 97 in New York City, which mandates that every building that's over 25,000 square feet needs to cut its emissions by 40% by the end of this decade and 80% by 2050. That is a very, very dramatic uh, change. And uh, of course, if you're trying to move more air uh, to meet the standards that are mentioned here by ASHRAE, the CDC, and Lancet, moving that air is going to require energy. So that's going to actually take you in the opposite direction of your emissions and sustainability goals. So it's a real challenge to think about how do I ensure my indoor spaces are healthier and cleaner at, at the same time that I need to really watch my energy uh, use. And that's why now is the time to really be thinking about, is there a better way to approach this problem? So I mentioned that Asteroid changed their guidance. I want to double click on that a little bit and show you really what they've done. And the, the, this slide really has two points. The first point is that uh, they look at different kinds of spaces and they recognize that different kinds of spaces represent different levels of risk. So for example, on the left in the healthcare space, in an exam room, Traditionally, they have uh, recommended six air changes per hour. In a waiting room, they've recommended 12. These are the numbers in blue. Uh, in education settings, they, moving to the right, they've recommended between three and three and a half, uh, and so on. <coughs> so point one is that different kinds of spaces have different levels of risk. We'll talk about more about that more in a second. But point number two is as they move from the Existing standards, uh, 62.1, which was in non-healthcare, non-residential spaces, and 170, which was for healthcare, as they've adopted this new standard, 241, 
you can see that 241 standard is represented in purple. You can see that they've upped the guidance very, very significantly, really across all space types. In some cases, up to six times greater uh, um, recommendation for equivalent air changes compared to their prior recommendation. Now, 241 is a standard for the control of infectious aerosols in uh, situations where you have uh, a high risk of transmission of disease. So that's what that standard is designed to uh, help uh, building owners and managers uh, address. And the reality is it's very, very hard to actually hit these standards in the traditional way of operating. And we'll talk about that more uh, in just a bit. But let me also uh, talk through different kinds of space types just to give you a sense of where the risk is. So let's look at a school. So a typical 900 person, 900 student school is going to have around 40 classrooms, cafeteria, locker room, break room, gyms and auditoriums. These kinds of spaces are really high risk because they have a lot of people in them. Uh, in the case of a gym or uh, a locker room, you have people often who are exerting themselves uh, and thereby exhaling more than they would otherwise be doing if they're sitting quietly and working. Uh, and so the combination of the occupancy and the exertion uh, ends up increasing the overall level of risk in that space, of, of bio burden, if you want to call it that, in that space. There are some other spaces like a library that tends to have lower occupancy. People tend to be fairly quiet in the library where that risk is just going to be a lot lower. Uh, if we look at uh, a senior living facility, Similarly, you can see that there are high, medium, and lower risk spaces. The dining rooms tend to be the higher risk spaces. Physical therapy or physical or, or fitness rooms similarly are places with greater exertion, higher risk. A private patient room, which has almost no one in it other than the occupant, is going to be a much lower risk space. Uh, so that gives you a sense of kind of some of the distinctions. Now, obviously, these are you know, generalizations, and every building is going to be a little bit different. So it's important as you're thinking about this in your own context to uh, work with an organization like R0 to uh, help you be more precise in calibrating the risks of your different spaces. Now, so risk is variable, but what is the consequence of the poor disinfection that we're seeing? It's really really expensive. So just a few statistics for you. For example, in the U.S., the lost productivity from people being out is $150 billion a year. It's really huge. Uh, and 60% of employees are generally prioritizing their health and well-being. But fixing this problem with traditional methods is very expensive. So if you try to increase airflow to meet these new standards that I just talked about uh, with HVAC, you're going to increase your <clears throat> energy use um, by 2 to 4x, and you're going to increase your emissions by up to 20x. So it is an enormously expensive, both from your sustainability goals and for your uh, budget, to address this problem if you're only applying traditional means to it. So that's kind of where ultraviolet uh disinfection comes in. So let's talk a little bit briefly just about the history of this and how it's come to be uh, before we talk about how we can apply it. So the history and science of uh, ultraviolet uh, disinfection. This really comes, uh, it's not a new technology at all. It actually comes from the early 1900s. And in 1903, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was actually uh, granted for a doctor who was treating lupus patients with a UVC lamp. Uh, and since the 1910s, UVC treatment has become uh, very common as part of municip municipal water uh, treatment. And now it's in over 50% of water systems in the U.S. So it's a very well understood uh, technology in some of these use cases. Fast forward to the 1930s, and in 1937, there was kind of a pivotal year because there were two really interesting things that happened. Number one... Uh, William Wells, uh, one of the godfathers of indoor air uh, research and science, uh, indoor air quality research and science, uh, helped to uh, reduce 
the transmission rate of measles in an epidemic in suburban Philadelphia by 75% by installing UVC lamps uh, near the ceilings. You can see them in this photo, they're circled, uh, near the ceilings to shine light up and across the top of the room. Uh, we'll talk more about this approach uh, in a little bit. And it was a, a, an incredibly successful approach in that, uh, in that epidemic. That same year, uh, it, at Duke Hospital, uh, a surgeon there who ended up later becoming the president of the university was able to use UVC in uh, the surgical theater to reduce the risk of infection. If you think back to the 1930s, the risk of infection uh, from surgery was a lot higher than it is today. So the effect that he was able to uh, create by adding UVC was incredibly dramatic. He reduced it from 11 to less than 1%. So an enormously successful uh, outcome. Now, let's just uh, explain a bit more about what UVC even is. So the ultraviolet spectrum, of course, is light that is at a lower wavelength than visible light. So you can see visible light here is between 400 and 760 uh, nanometers. Uh, infrared is even uh, higher wavelength. Uh, but the shorter wavelengths from visible light are ultraviolet, and that ultraviolet spectrum is divided into three parts, UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC is the shortest of those. And then within ultraviolet a C radiation uh, um, light, there are, of course, different uh, wavelengths that have different properties. So generally, uh, toward the higher end of UVC, uh, 254, 265 nanometers, those have really good penetration. They're very germicidal, but they're also not safe to shine onto human skin. Uh, if you go at the other end, the toward closer to 200 nanometers, far UV has less penetration and it is uh, perfectly safe for humans. And it still has a germicidal effect on pathogens uh, that are more susceptible to it than we are because the surface of our skin uh, protects us from that radiation. What is it actually doing, though? What it's actually doing when it penetrates into a pathogen or cell is it's destroying the DNA and the RNA. And that means that pathogen cannot replicate, whether it's a virus, whether it's a bacteria. And that means that effectively it's no longer uh, a risk to anybody in that space that's sharing that space with it. And so one of the modalities for ultraviolet uh, radiation that I shared with you uh, uh, in that Philadelphia example is upper room. And I wanted to just dig in a little bit on that. This image is from the CDC website. Uh, and so they've recognized for a number of years the value that ultraviolet germicidal uh, light can provide. And so you can see in this image that they have an ultraviolet germicidal device uh, on the left shining up uh, and across the top of the room. There's somebody who is ill uh, near that window, it says there that they're sick with COVID-19. And if you look closely, there's a lot of little red uh, particles around them, basically what they're breathing out. And you can see that as they're breathing those particles out, they're rising up toward the top of the room because our breath is generally warmer than the ambient environment that uh, of the spaces we occupy. And so as that breath rises, it rises into the disinfection zone where it gets, um, you know, where where the pathogens, in this case, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, pathogen is inactivated. And then the convection, you know, brings that uh, air back down and keeps everybody else in the room safe. So that's really an example of how this technology works. Uh, and it works really well because it doesn't disrupt the use of the space by everybody uh, in the space. You know, it's ultraviolet light. You can't even see it. You wouldn't even know it's there, but it's protecting that space that everybody is, uh, is in. Uh, and it can deliver up to 12 equivalent air changes per hour. So if you think about the guidance back on that slide that I showed you with the charts, if you're trying to go from, you know, two or three or four to five or six or seven or 10 <coughs> or even higher, it's very, very difficult to do without a technology like this. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, risks in different kinds of settings. Um, 
We talked about them in a hospital. Uh, sorry, we talked about them in senior care. We talked about them in a the school. In a hospital, the risk is a bit uh, a bit different uh, because you have a more specific risk to the patient from hospital acquired infections or surgical site infections. So hospital acquired infections, you know, are are infections that are commonly acquired because maybe a previous patient in the room in, was uh, ha had a pathogen. Maybe they weren't even sick from it. We, of course, all carry lots of pathogens on us, uh, most of which don't bother us. But if we're particularly immunocompromised or susceptible, they might uh, cause illness to us. So there's a great deal of focus, of course, on disinfection, uh, both when people are staying in a room as well as in between patients uh, staying in a room. But when that isn't done perfectly, there is a risk of a hospital-acquired uh, infection. And then there's the risk of a surgical site infection. We already talked about the example from Duke in the 1930s of reducing the risk of those infections. So although it's come down because we generally have better practices now than 100 years ago, thankfully, that risk is still significant. Uh, and um, so it's still something that hospitals watch very closely and look for ways to uh, remediate. And then a third risk is actually to the staff, the staff that are doing the cleaning and the disinfection. Uh, in many hospitals, these staff members are going in and using electrostatic spraying to disinfect room patient rooms uh, in, between, uh, in between patients. And that in itself can cause staff to get ill um, and potentially cause, you know, workman's comp or even lawsuits back to... <coughs> excuse me, back to the hospital. And then lastly, non-clinical space. There's actually more non-clinical space than clinical space in a typical hospital. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what it boils down to is there's a lot of spaces that need to be cleaned. And people moving through those spaces that are either ill themselves or more susceptible to catching a bug because they're, again, immunocompromised, they're in the hospital. So thinking about how you protect those cafeterias, those hallways, those elevators, it's not as uh, as simple a job as doing it in a uh, typical corporate environment or some other public space. So now that we've talked about the different kinds of risks that apply in different spaces, let's talk about infection control. Um, this is particularly a focus for hospitals, um, as as we discussed. What is the actual impact or the the business value of of addressing this? So if you can lower those surgical site infections by 30%, a typical hospital, if you use national average data, can save about $100,000 every year from reducing 30% of the surgical site infections that would otherwise happen in the from the uh, procedures in that operating room. And 30% is not an outrageous um, uh, uh, goal. As I said before, back in the 1930s, UVC light helped to reduce from 11% to 1. That was a very dramatic improvement. Now the baseline is lower, but there's still room for improvement. In the case of the uh, more typical kind of patient environment outside of uh, the operating room, uh, in, in, a, in a patient room uh, or just patients in the hospital in general, if you can lower the risk of uh, hospital-acquired infections from just from one particularly nasty bug, uh, C. diff, by 30%, you can save about $1,800 for every staffed bed in the hospital. Um, and this, these estimates are based on uh, the cost of a surgical site infection, the most recent data uh, that is kind of reliable and, and well-studied, is not that new, uh, and it's about $28,000 for every surgical site infection. In the case of C. diff, it's about $34,000 in direct costs. And given that this data is more than a few years old, those costs have probably actually gone up in the intervening years. So if anything, this is a bit of a conservative estimate. Now let's talk about improving indoor air quality. So let's say you operate a space or you work in a space and you're bought into the fact that you need to increase that indoor air quality you need to improve the uh 
equivalent air changes, whether you're going to focus on the CDC goal of five, the Lancet goal of six or more, <coughs> or some of that ASHRAE guidance, which for certain spaces is considerably higher. How are you going to achieve that? Well, the challenge fundamentally is that if you're going to try to do it by moving air, it's really, really hard. So you can increase the ventilation itself, but it's very hard to turn up the level of airflow. Most HVAC systems are designed to deliver a certain amount of air. So you have a choice, either run it more. Uh, in the case of some of the schools that I've met here at this conference, they've shared that they sometimes purge air before school and after school so that they can increase the amount of fresh air that they have in the building. But the consequence of that is, of course, a high energy bill. That's a lot more air that you have to heat or cool. <coughs> or you can increase uh, the size of your HVAC system, which is a, an enormous cost uh, of, of um, capital to change out a big system like that. Um, it's typically not something that you can configure by room or, or change based on you know one particular space having greater risk than another. Um, and it also, if you do that, if you run your system harder, it's going to not last as long. In many cases, a consequence of COVID is a lot of spaces have increased their level of filtration. They've gone to MERV 13 filters. And those filters work because they're finer uh, mesh. <coughs> so they capture more, you know, more of the uh, pathogens in the air. But a consequence of pushing something through a finer mesh is you have to push harder. So that actually means it's harder to move air than it was with a less fine mesh filter filter and so that actually is working against your ability to get uh air changes per hour into a given space so all in all hvac is great at keeping us comfortable it's not so great at turning over the air <coughs> excuse me turning over the air frequently enough to really maintain a high level of air changes per hour Another option is to just keep that filtration happening inside the space with portable air filters. And many of us have purchased these for our homes. Many of us have kids in school who uh, have HEPA filters in their classrooms. But these are also really challenging. They're noisy. They get in the way. You have to frequently replace the filters. They break down. For school facility staff, they're a real challenge to manage. And they only really add a handful of uh, equivalent air changes also. So they're not really enough. Compare that with adding an upper room uh, ultraviolet, ultraviolet germicidal uh, light. As we talked about, even back in the 1930s with the technology they had there, they were able to, have a, able to get a very dramatic benefit of it uh, in the case of that uh, example in Philadelphia. Today, we have upper room uh, units that run with LED lights that can add 12 or more air changes per hour uh, in a 500 square foot room. We have uh, ultraviolet lights that operate at the far UV spectrum that points down and is safe for humans that can add uh, two or three air changes per hour in a smaller area. And these devices operate on very little energy. They're completely silent. And they don't have any moving parts that you have to replace. So they're much easier to maintain for the long, for the long haul. So it, when you look at, you know, the way to improve indoor air quality, ultraviolet light really stands out as a dramatically better way to achieve that goal that we're trying to achieve. So just to give you a sense of what that beam looks like, uh, what that uh, upper room unit looks like that R0 makes, this is... Uh, this is the R0 beam in a classroom setting. It's like I said, it uses LEDs. Those lights uh, last 15,000 hours and it can disinfect very large uh, spaces with very little energy use. So now let's talk about improving surface disinfection. So a couple of uh, examples of how you can do that. One is with a mobile tower. So this is our R0 arc. And this can get moved around through a classroom or a medical facility uh, or a senior care center or an office building uh, after hours or when a, a space is unoccupied. 
<clears throat> turn it on for a few minutes. In the case of a thousand square feet, you can run it for seven minutes and it will disinfect anything that uh, the light shines on and it will disinfect it to a really high level. So typically 99.99% of some of the microbes in that space are going to get uh, inactivated in just a few minutes. And this can be a great boon to, uh, you know, custodial staffs that otherwise might be spending a lot of time uh, wiping down every desk, every surface. And that's a fairly common use case that we uh, see our customers applying. Now, Vive is a far UV device. You can see it up on the ceiling in this image in a bathroom. And Vive is great for settings like bathrooms, like nurses' stations, uh, above the uh, checkout line in a cafeteria or dining hall uh, because it is able to disinfect surfaces and air while people are in that space. And if you think about what happens in the bathroom, somebody flushes the toilet and there's actually a plume uh, of aerosols that's created by that. Uh, and if there's anything infectious uh, in you know, from that, uh, in the waste from that person, that's going to be carried up in that plume into the air in that space. So Vive is going to take care of that problem. One of the main reasons that you have odors in bathrooms is also bacteria. It's going to take care of uh, inactivating those bacteria so that you don't have the odor problem. <coughs> and it's also going to make sure, you know, that the, uh, that the air outside the stalls, you know, that the surfaces along the sinks, et cetera, are, are all uh, continuously being disinfected. Now, just to show you a little bit of results from some of these products, we've tested it in a lot of real world settings. So at the Mayo Clinic, for example, we were able to reduce uh, hard to inactivate spores of B. subtilis by 96 plus percent, up to 99.8%. At Trilogy Health Services, which is a big senior care uh, facility manager and owner, we were able to reduce viable surface bacteria by 80%, airborne pathogens by 93%, and the same B. subtilis spores by 99.9%. And we also did a pretty significant study in one of the five largest school districts in the U.S. where we tested seven schools uh, against seven control schools. And in the seven schools we tested, we installed the upper room units, the beam. And as a consequence of that, we did wastewater testing across all 14 schools. And we saw that the schools with the ultraviolet light had a 53% reduction in the level of the virus uh, that causes COVID. And we had no complaints or safety incidents throughout that uh throughout that process, or indeed ever in our history from any customer. Um, next, let me talk about operational efficiency. Uh, I know staff shortages wasn't a, a, a huge topic, but it, it ties very nicely into operational efficiency, so I'll just tie them together. So surface and air disinfection is very expensive, as we touched on earlier. Um, it's not just the HVAC cost, it's also the cost of your people moving through the space, the chemicals that they use and the labor that they uh, have to apply. So in a typical 130 bed acute hospital, they can save <clears throat> almost $400,000 a year just on the manual disinfection that they're doing of all of the non-clinical spaces. And we already talked earlier about the savings from the infection control. So just to give you an example of kind of some of the spaces to think about, in the waiting room, you'll recall that ASHRAE recommended 40 air changes per hour. Uh, that's a really, really high rate. Uh, and, you know, if you think about the way a waiting room is being disinfected today, uh, somebody's coming in in the evening and wiping down all the surfaces. Somebody may be coming through every few hours and just spot checking, um, making sure that everything looks fine, wiping down or cleaning up any uh, any spills or, or other areas of concern. But other than that, when, you know, a waiting room is full of people and one of those people might be uh, infectious, there's really nothing to protect everybody else who's around them. It doesn't do me any good 
uh, if I'm sitting next to somebody who's ill, it doesn't do me any good that that space was disinfected five hours ago or last night. I need it to be disinfected right now as I'm sitting in that space next to somebody who has a potential to get me sick. And so that's why uh, having an upper room system in a space like this can be very, very powerful because it's continuously disinfecting the air and preventing uh, or, or lowering dramatically the risk that the person who's sitting next to me and exhaling some pathogen is going to uh, be able to uh, to infect me because that pathogen load is being constantly uh, inactivated by, by the system. <coughs> Excuse me. In a patient room, you think about a patient uh, who... You know, ideally, you want to create kind of a zone of protection around them. So a far UV device sitting above a, a patient or, or uh, mounted above a patient on the ceiling can be a really great way to protect them so that as people come into the space, whether it's a nurse, a doctor, a family member, what have you, anything that they might bring in uh, or anything that might be uh, on a floor, that might be uh, on the sheets, might be on the wall, uh, a door handle, et cetera. Anything that, uh, any pathogen load on those kinds of surfaces is going to be constantly uh, uh, disinfected as well. And that's going to make that patient uh, less likely to pick up uh, some kind of uh, illness. And then in the cafeteria, similarly to the waiting room, you have a situation of a lot of people congregating. Even if you are, uh, you know, in a, in an area where a lot of people are masking, in the cafeteria, people are generally going to take their masks off so that they can eat. So again, you have a similar problem to the waiting room uh, in, in this setting, uh, in some cases, maybe even worse. And so having a continuous air disinfection solution here is going to reduce the risk uh, of transmission uh, in this kind of space. Now let's talk about a school. In a school, uh, similarly, you have chemicals, you have labor. Uh, that's going to add up to quite a lot of expense. And in a typical 900-person school, you know, you might be able to save up to $80,000 in manual disinfection just in the higher uh, risk spaces, the spaces with the higher bio load, spaces with more occupancy and, uh, uh, and a higher risk of, uh, of transmission. And that can result in a payback that's as low as 14 months. So it's really quite a, a cost-effective approach. And that doesn't even take into effect, uh, take into effect the, uh, the savings of energy uh, on the HVAC. So that can even lower that payback quite, quite dramatically. So for example, in a classroom, again, it's much the same story as what we talked about in the healthcare setting. It's great that somebody might be disinfecting uh, overnight, wiping a surface down, but it doesn't do me any good as a teacher or a student if somebody else in the classroom is infected. It's going to maybe help prevent somebody getting sick tomorrow, but it's not going to help me today. So what I need to be doing is constantly disinfecting the air around me throughout the course of the day. In a gym, same challenge. Now, gyms tend to be much bigger spaces, so in a bigger gym, we would recommend a couple of beams, perhaps, maybe even three if it's very big. Uh, but actually, uh, somewhat counterintuitively, a bigger space with a high ceiling can sometimes be more effective uh, use for ultraviolet light because there's more of the volume of air above the spot that you've mounted it. And so more of the fraction of the volume of air in the room is getting disinfected continuously. And so you can actually achieve very, very good results uh, uh, with an upper room system. And in a bathroom or a kitchen, you know, we kind of already talked about the example of a Vive and how it can not only disinfect uh, the air and the surfaces, but also address issues like uh, odor which is also bacterial. It can address issues like mold because ultraviolet light also inactivates mold spores. And lastly, let's talk about a senior care facility. Similar challenge, chemicals, labor. In a senior care facility, the fraction of space 
that is particularly high risk is a lot lower because most of the space in the senior care facility is in the patient rooms where people are usually uh, by themselves or, or in very small groups. Uh, so the amount of uh, disinfection that's happening in those higher risk spaces uh, on a relative basis ends up being lower than in a school uh, or certainly in a healthcare setting. And so a typical 100 bed facility can still save about $50,000 on manual disinfection of the risky spaces if they're applying ultraviolet. Now, I, one thing I didn't mention is what is actually generating the savings? It's a couple of things. One way that you're generating the savings is the chemicals that you're not using quite as frequently. And the other way is that, that you're not, you don't need to apply quite the same level of labor. So for example, we have school customers who instead of disinfecting every desk, they're wheeling in an arc at night, disinfecting in seven minutes what would otherwise take them 20, 25 minutes. Uh, another example, in the waiting room, in the hospital, if you have uh, the uh, ultraviolet, uh, sorry, the upper room uh, germicidal UV going on like, a, like an R0 beam, that means you don't have to do the same level uh, of disinfection, of manual disinfection. So it ends up basically meaning you don't have to come through that space quite as often with your staff. They don't have to use as many chemicals and you're going to generate savings uh, by reducing that level of manual uh, operations. And in a senior care facility, uh, the payback is really, really quick because uh, because the, the fraction of space that they have to address and that they can address with UV is, is, uh, is different. So it can be as short as five months. In a, just to give you a little bit more sense, in the senior care example, physical therapy rooms are a great use for um, for a system like Vive that can both disinfect the surfaces, a treadmill, or uh, you know uh, other type of exercise equipment, as well as uh, the air in that smaller kind of space. And in the cafeteria, similar to the example we talked about in other settings, you know you want to make sure that the air in there is constantly getting uh, turned over and uh, cleaned. So lastly, let's talk about energy savings and sustainability. So as we talked about up front, using HVAC is really tough to get the levels of air changes per hour that you need. And even if you could do it, it's incredibly expensive, both for your uh, energy and as well as your sustainability goals. When you think about manual disinfection, you're talking about using fairly nasty chemicals, which you have to buy, store, uh, dispose of, and you're talking about a lot of uh, wipes, uh, towels, and other things that you end up disposing of. So all of that adds up to quite a lot of waste. Uh, so ultraviolet uh, disinfection is incredibly more effective and uh, and efficient and sustainable. Um, and the, and it's really kind of it, it, it's almost embarrassing how much better uh, how much better it is than the way we've been disinfecting space for the last you know 50 to uh, 100 years. You can eliminate all of the chemicals that are used uh, in the uh, disinfection cycles that you avoid, you can get 95 or more percent improvement in energy use. You can get dramatic improvements as a consequence of that in greenhouse gas emissions, and you don't have any of the waste. So it's kind of, a, a, in many ways, a, a slam dunk. So let me just wrap up by sharing a little bit more about uh, R0 and then we'll take some questions. So we're really the only real-time indoor health and disinfection uh, uh, platform. We talked a little bit about some of our products already, but it's not just about ultraviolet. We actually start by understanding your environment, by sensing and installing sensors so we understand the indoor air quality, so we understand where people actually are in your spaces, because regardless of the space, it's only uh, a risk to people if there are a lot of people in it. 
And so it's important to understand where, where and when people are uh, congregating in different kinds of spaces and address the risks in the, in, the, uh, in the time that they're there. And so we have a suite of sensors that help us uh, measure that. We have very sophisticated modeling that helps us uh, determine risk. And then we can remediate it with the various disinfection products that we have talked about. And then continuously measure, optimize, find the next riskiest space that we can uh, help you with. And do it all with very low energy use, with essentially almost no maintenance uh, and uh, in a much more kind of clean way than the traditional approach to disinfection with, uh, with manual approaches. I'll leave you with just a, a few examples of some of our customers. Uh, Carl Health is a health system uh, mostly in Illinois, but also Indiana, uh, Washington, and North Carolina. Uh, and they're using us across a number of facilities in Illinois. And they're now uh, using us to disinfect all of their patient rooms whenever they turn over. They're using us to disinfect operating rooms and uh, finding it to be a, a very uh, effective and, um, and really desired technology. So they were previously uh, doing electrostatic spraying in every patient room. And the uh, EVS team, frankly, really didn't like to do that. It was making some of the workers ill. And so the day that they announced that they were going to drop electrostatic spraying and replace it with uh, UV was a day that the EVS team was very, very happy uh, about. In Fort Bend Independent School District outside of Houston, there are 80,000 students in 80 schools. Uh, they use UV disinfection every uh, in every school every day to replace some of the manual disinfection that they're doing in the classrooms. And that's helping them become more efficient and it doesn't require them to do any maintenance like they would have had to do with uh, more filtration based approaches. And as you can see, we have a wide range of customers across uh, a variety of different uh, industries. So we're very proud of the success that we've been able to, uh, to bring to our partners across, uh, really across the US and across the world. And so with that, uh, I hope that there was some good takeaways for you here in thinking about new ways to think about disinfection and uh, a number of the ways that those new approaches can really pay for themselves, whether that's improving energy use, whether that's helping to meet sustainability goals, whether that's improving indoor health, whether that's addressing you know, more efficient janitorial practices uh, or the shortages that a lot of people have around uh, janitorial staff. All of these are, uh, are challenges that building owners and managers around the country and the world face every day. And uh, really bringing a better approach and a more automated approach and more self-sustaining approach to disinfection is what we're all about. And I hope that that's helpful. So let me just see if there are any questions and uh, uh, I can address those. As I, as I look into that, I will note that in the chat at the beginning of the hour, I put a few links to our, our, our ROI calculators on our website. We have uh, several of those depending on the industry that you're in. So I'd encourage you to check those out uh, and see what kind of savings you might be able to achieve. Those ROI calculators are largely based just on janitorial savings, at least for the school and senior care uh, audience. Uh, and so uh, keep in mind that you'll have quite a lot of additional savings from running your HVAC more efficiently, uh, but that's uh, something we, we can discuss with you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So now let me turn to questions and see uh, what questions you have, uh, if, if any. Uh, so one question that's come in is, how do I talk to my staff about implementing ultraviolet uh, disinfection in our building? Well, uh, it, of course, depends on the context, uh, both of your staff and on what you want to implement. So as I already mentioned at Carl Health, they were overjoyed to be able to get rid of electrostatic spraying as a practice that they were uh, 
pretty invested in uh, for every patient room. Um, if you are if you're thinking about using a mobile tower as part of a uh, janitorial routine, then of course you have to talk to your staff about changing the way that they work. Uh, but in our experience, walking uh, through how it works, walking you know walking through a shift with people, uh, people are, find it very easy to use and are quite happy that they no longer have to do quite as much manual uh, work. If, on the other hand, you're talking about an installed product, then it's really a question of just letting people know. People might be curious, what is this new device on the wall? What is it doing? How does it work? Uh, and we're actually in the process of um, producing and rolling out some informational content on that that you can um, have available with a QR code on the wall uh, under a device so that anybody who's curious about it can uh, learn more. But generally, we've found very high rates of acceptance and excitement and enthusiasm uh, about applying a new technology to create a healthier and safer space for people. So hopefully that's a, a helpful answer to that question. Um, whether you have, whether if you have a follow-up question on that, of course, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to to engage directly with you. Uh, my email is ukogan at r0.com. Uh, now, uh, one other question has come in. Do we have any products that fit in a drop ceiling? Uh, that's a great question. So we do uh, have a product that is kind of like, uh, shaped like a soup can that can mount onto a drop ceiling. We have uh, the Vive product that I showed you that mounts, we had it in a picture mounted uh, in a bathroom. Uh, that mounts to a regular uh, lighting fixture junction box, regular J box. Um, and uh, one other question that's just come in is about comparison of the percent power. Uh, oh, I think there's more to this question. Okay. Uh, consumption between HVAC and beam. Yeah, so the way that we've uh, calculated that is basically if you want to achieve an additional air change per hour and you do that with HVAC, you're going to have to push a lot of air through the HVAC. You're going to have to heat it. You're going to have to cool it. Obviously, the specifics of that are going to depend on where you are, what kind of system you have, the season, etc. But generally speaking, if you have to move air, heat air, cool air, you're using a lot of energy. Beam uses about the same amount of energy as a laptop. So, you know, it might be 95% more efficient in some cases. It might be 90% more efficient in some cases. It might be 99% more efficient in some cases. A lot of it depends on, you know, the specifics of your situation. But generally speaking, we see it uh, roughly being 20x more efficient than achieving that same level of improvement with an HVAC system. Hopefully that helps. Uh, again, happy to work through specifics of your situation in your building uh, and come up with a more precise calculation uh, based on uh, based on your situation. Uh, I think at the moment, those are all the questions we've had. So if you have any other questions, please uh, get them in. As I said, always happy to uh, have you reach out and um, and address questions after the fact as well. Oh, another question just came in about mold. Uh, how does UVC kill mold? Do I still need to get a contractor to look behind the walls? It's a great question. So UVC light uh, inactivates pathogens that the light hits. So if you have a mold issue that's actually behind a wall or inside the wood or something like that, we're not going to address that. And I don't want to mislead you. Uh, but what we are going to do is when that mold is on the surface or if some of the mold from inside the wall or behind the wall is making it through and entering the air where, of course, it now is going to cause illness, that's where we're going to be able to hit that mold, inactivate it, and prevent it from spreading further. So hopefully that helps. It looks like those were all the questions that we had. Uh, so I think we will leave it there. Thank you all so much for joining. I hope you learned something. And again, more than happy to engage with you uh, 
one-on-one -on -one with any additional questions that you have. So please do reach out. Again, I'm U-K-O-G-A-N at R0.com and uh, would be uh, would be more than happy to, uh, to chat. I'll uh, leave my contact information right there for you and wish you all a wonderful day uh, and uh, a happy holiday season.